Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, hi, this is Coffee Compiler Club. Everyone here is old timers. We're all being recorded live. You're going to be up on YouTube within an hour. We're, we're talking about compilers. Right now we're talking about meta organization of Coffee Compiler Club. But uh, anything to do with compilers and language runtimes and yada, yada, yada. People who watch this have heard it all before. Uh, that's it. Back to whether or not we get uh, you know swag out of this. I can, I can probably find that logo. I didn't lose it. Let me, let me restate that. I didn't throw it away. It's on my hard drive somewhere. Um, yeah, and then you know people can have can have stickers for their laptops. Probably we're already doing stickers for Burning Man. So. Stickers are fine because I, th I was thinking more of an organizational uh, to some kind of topics because more in-depth information because our conversations jump from one theme to another to another. And it's uh, cool to watch it as a season episode, but if you want to, one slice of information, right. the front end, the tokenizer, uh, the mixer, the namer, the type system, et cetera, et cetera. I am totally up for you doing that. No, oh, I will try to find the time. Well, it's it's in the idea space for now. No yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well over my. Yeah, you just, you just need somebody to execute it. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's definitely profit will be cool, 50, but, 50. But that really sounds like a full time job because uh, we will all try. work after the meeting. It is. To, uh, it to is. We can all the useful information of yeah. like. Yeah. One yeah. and a half hours or two hours yeah. video. This is I, I someone did, did that for Jonathan video. Blow's language. Uh, Jonathan has a bunch of YouTube videos of like, here's a three hour stream of me writing the compiler. Oh. And then there's another channel that's Blow Fan that's like, here is a five minute clip of him actually explaining a single atomic piece that makes sense as a chunk. Well, who does the work then? to break those out. Yeah, fine. Yeah, that's a lot of work. It's not it's not my life to run a YouTube channel for education. No, it right? is. We we can try our best to systematize some kind of information. It, it's all all the good as far as I'm mm -hmm. concerned. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. like I said you are you are totally yes. welcome. There's a big difference between wanting to produce material for education and wanting to uh Yeah, just yeah. talk about compilers and if somebody else wants to organize it, more power yeah. to them. Yeah, it's I, it's not a couple of steps more. It's a huge step. It's more. a huge step more, right? I did the rocket school for a while, for a year. It was pretty good, but setting up for a course, holy crap, that take a lot of work. You don't you don't think so, or you don't realize it. I guess if you've done it, you know. It, you know, it's like, oh, these are fun to watch. I learned a lot. This is really great. Oh my god, the guy who put that video together spent you know weeks on end sorting out what I, to say uh, and what not to and. My the moment where I learned that was I used to think of TCP as a relatively simple, straightforward protocol until I went to teach it to undergrads. Ah. And I realized that that class has to start with like, assume two processes are trying to communicate. Yeah. This is how you might do a ring buffer. Okay, now how would we do a ring buffer across the network? And yeah, boy, do you have to break that down to small steps yeah. to be digestible. By so my, my rule of thumb is that uh, for one hour of teaching material to be any good, it's a minimum of a hundred hours of preparation. So, I mean, it's yeah, probably like too steep. Or... I was thinking ten to one. I, I'm thinking well, right. It depends what your level of of, of quality is. Well, I usually I put ten, I to, one 10 to one, and I'm usually disappointed. So yeah, <laughs> there you go. But if I ten was to one to, is a minimum, yeah. If I was to do this for a living and be teaching every day then over the course of applying the same material and then refining it i think it gets stacked up pretty fast this you, you get you get bigger quicker as soon as you're trying to refine it because you're repetitively teaching over and over well but then you easily accumulate 100 to one yeah and that's what i'm saying yeah uh, yeah yeah I, I i think it was high until i think if i'm going to do it a lot then maybe maybe it's not i, I do think it's getting better the first time you told the why do you need a graph coloring registers because you're going to spill and now you have to essentially reconstruct the calls in a reasonable way the first time you explained that it was very confusing and by like the third time you did in these talks it was much cleaner and tighter on graph coloring register allocators yes yeah, and yeah. why that is such a big win mainly because you can inline more aggressively 
Ah, yeah, yeah, sorry. It, well, okay, fair enough. Some I feel of like that, that was a long just... explanation the first time, and now it's like, you want graph oh. coloring register allocator so you can inline aggressively. And now I, you get to the point where you can you say- want that. A, I concur. You I want definitely a high like... quality allocation that mm -hmm. doesn't suffer from spills. And graph coloring gets you a higher quality than linear scan typically, but I don't care how you got there. The limit to inlining is usually the register allocator. You have enough to inline. You want the register allocator to, to support it. And that's why I went to graph coloring. Now I've lost Dan. So let me go get Dan in here. Uh, interesting that in our case, the limit for inlining is compile time at the moment. Okay, you're using LLVM. That's yeah. Okay, yeah. I don't know. Like, right. We, we are fine with register allocator quality. Our problem is if we inline too aggressively, we just spend so much compile time right. on like pulling it through the optimizer. Right. This is LLVM versus C2. Do you know yeah. why that gets slow? Uh, I was well, told. By, sorry, go ahead. Well, by inlining more, you just produce more code to pull through the, through the optimizer. And then because many of the optimizations are nonlinear, uh, just by increasing the size of a method, you like spend more time working on it, even if the total amount of code you compile is the same. Yeah, C2 is only using linear algorithms and with really, really low constants, except in the register allocator where it's vaguely n squared with a very small squared constant but a big method will cause the allocator to spin n squared growth on the time. So that'll be the tall pole, but all other algorithms in C2 are all linear. And other, so the, another aspect, when you, you inline aggressively, you have, a, you start getting overlaps in what you compile. Like the same candidate can be inlined in 10 places. And now you end up compiling this like inline candidate 10 times. Yeah. So part of the heuristics for inlining in C2, take into account, that the method you want, you're pondering inlining is large and been compiled already and only modestly hot. And if it's too big, and of course there's a knobs you can turn and it's too not hot enough, you decide to forego the inlining, although there'd be some profit, you lose for iCash blowout. Um, compile time is less of an issue for C2 because it's so much faster, but, but you do get iCache blowout if you keep replicating over and over and over again some modestly large method who's modestly hot in modestly a lot of places. Yeah, it, it's interesting how in different systems you end up with different trade-offs. Like you said that, okay, uh, inlining and register allocator where the trade-offs are like the limiting factor in C2. Well, once you get this done, uh, you get another limiting factors. Oh, like when you have different system, which is much slower, you get different limiting factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're limited because LLVM is much slower compiler. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, oh, I still think the right decision here is to inline more and fix LLVM slowness, but you know, that's neither here nor there. So if you want a really slow register allocator, there's this thing called Unison. What? Unison? So, yeah. So like they basically said, you know, we're going instead of, you know, using an algorithm that gives, you know, good results in most cases, like graph coloring, oh. we're going to use combinatorial optimization to search oh. over the whole space yep. of possible register allocation sequences. Somebody's done satisfiability solvers, SAT solvers for register allocation too. Yeah. And they claimed, you know, reasonably good running time, but orders of magnitude slower than C2's graph coloring allocator. I mean, I can tell you some tricks for making a graph coloring allocator run faster. I tried to get those published years ago and everyone wanted to see a comparison with code quality between graph coloring and linear scan. And no one wanted to see how to make graph coloring color faster. There's a. Um, it's funny because if you look at the most cited papers in the world, there are like, here is a technique for doing something. Yeah, this is a technique. Yeah, it's a stupid ass technique. And it's, it's like, uh, you have to be sort of knee deep in graph coloring allocators to make sense. But you, you willingly flip presentations from, uh, um, you, you have to do live ranges as a, as a uh, graph with no basically nodes and edges and you switch switch it between like a list of outgoing edges for a particular node in the graph 
to a bit vector and back and forth, that's one of the hacks that usually that's a guaranteed loser to copy data structures, but you need the efficiency of either version at different points in the algorithm. And so you end up flipping back and forth. I just picked up Kirk here. And the other one, one is when you're doing the trivial coloring and you're removing edges out of the graph, if at that point you have a node and edges presentation, so you have an array of your nodes, each node has an array of ints, which is just the node number for the matching edge in the graph. And you've decided you can trivially color an edge, you want to pull it out. You take this array for one node and there's a guy in the middle, you said, I can color this edge. I'm going to pull them out by swapping in with the end guy and cutting my length down. Now the end guy has that edge in it. When you get done and you've emptied the list and you've and able to color everybody and you have to start actually applying colors you add the edges one at a time in reverse order well the edge, edge you're adding next is at the end of the list and so you just bump the list by one now the new edge is in the graph and he's guaranteed trivially colored just to go check which colors are, are floating around to give him a color and away you go so it, it turns out that the that the shrink the graph and grow the graph is very fast linear time uh behavior with everything just like two clocks one clock operation so it's really fast that piece of it and you take that action one time per use site or? per per go around oh i see yeah so so all right so in any register allocator there is the there is the attempt to to do something you fail spill and attempt again cycle until you're done in the graph coloring allocator that's a big cycle and the big cycle says start by building all the wide ranges i get a big interconnected graph of where everyone conflicts at the conflict sites i have to say you're, you're colorable or not and you're guaranteed colorable if you have fewer conflicts than you have registers because all the other conflicts will have some register and you'll just get a spare one um but if i exceed the number of registers i have i have to decide where to cut it so so right so, so you're not guaranteed if you exceed the number so now, given a particular graph you're trying to color, some of the edges are trivial. That is to say, you can guarantee that you have enough. So, so for the trivial guys, you throw them out one by one by one. As you throw them out, other edges become trivial. So you repeat this process until you get a closed clique of guys whose each guy has more neighbors than you have registers. You're not guaranteed a color. So at that point, you pick a dude who may not get a color, you may have to spill, and you toss him out, and then you go back to repeating until you empty the graph, and you end up with a pile of guys who may not get a color. Then you reverse. Everyone who's trivial just goes back in. You inspect their neighbors. They have fewer than X neighbors. They're guaranteed to color. You give them a color, and you move on. You insert, insert, insert. You come up to one of the guys you threw out because he wasn't guaranteed. You look. He might now get a color. He might not. If he doesn't get a color, you have to spill him. And then you flag him for spilling and you, you give him an empty color and you carry on unwinding him. You know, with a pile of guys that don't get a color, didn't get a color. Now these are the dudes you have to spill. And now this is where your spilling gets ugly, depending, and we spent a lot of effort on that. And there's things where you split the live range by cutting it into small pieces and some go to spill to the stack. and. You have like calling conventions which demand an argument register rex or rbx or whatever register and you cut it so that a small integer copy you know what a reg reg copy can move it around and stuff and you get a bunch of shorter live ranges and then you lather rinse repeat the whole cycle and in the wide variety of machines i've looked at on the first round through the colorer what you get is 90 95 percent are trivial five to ten percent won't get a color typically immediately because they have conflicts they were produced as a return result in rex they're going out in an outbound register in rbx they just must be spilled you do that and you spill all the guys who spilled for conflict anyhow and you go again and on the second go around the average size of the number of neighbors a live range has is the total number of registers on the hardware plus one on average it's kind of a funny deal so you have some live ranges in the first pass that have 300 neighbors. They're like ridiculously overcommitted. And you spilled them and you spilled a bunch of other dudes who had wrong register argument conflicts and shit happens. And the second go around, the average live range edge count is 
16 or 17 on a, on a you know, 15 register x86, because on average, you're really close <laughs> and you're asymptotically approaching colorability. And then you make another go around and you, cause you got a few more dudes who had to be cut a little tighter. And, uh, and suddenly you color typically on the you know, second or third pass you color for, for a big method, it's three. Really so even though the big O is N squared, it's actually going to act more like three. N. Um, it's no, the big O is N squared because you have to build an N squared size graph, which you multiply by three or four passes. And then, uh, cause I asked questions like, who are my neighbors? Well, that's the adjacency less. Then I asked questions like, did you conflict or not? That's a bit set lookup. So I end up with both versions and I go back and forth as to which one is getting used and what pass. And you have to rebuild them. So you want them to be incrementally rebuildable or mostly incrementally rebuildable and shit like that. So there's some hacks you do to preserve state to make it cheaper. Anyhow. And those data structures are pretty small. They're going to fit in L1 or L2. No, they're small. They're size your method squared, right? This is where Arthur was talking about N squared. This is the N squared piece. This is the size of the data structures. It's live ranges squared. Every live range might conflict with every other. What's a live range? Well, it's the same value that you've put in a register or, or kept in a local or whatever. After all, you're inlining. You've got some Java local value, whatever language local value. It spans this much code. Well, it conflicts with everyone in that pile of code. Well, the next guy started one instruction later and went one instruction shorter. Well, he conflicts with everybody in this pile and everybody and everybody and everybody. After inlining, you can be hundreds or whatever. So that's your n squared. After a couple go rounds, the adjacency list version, the count of split live ranges grew closer to the size. You know, it's 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 never asymptotically larger than your code in the first place, but your neighbors could be just as big, except after a couple go rounds, they, they become you know 15 or 16. And so you quit being n squared, but that first or second pass is always n squared. And it can blow out your L1. That's not a not an issue these days, even with a large L2. Back in the day, you could certainly blow out the L2s. I don't know how big Arthur lets his methods get, but uh, C2 would get the equivalent of tens of thousands of bytecodes, but typically not hundreds of thousands of bytecodes. But you could get there if the right kind of code is being compiled. And at that order of magnitude, you, you would expect to see thousands of live ranges with hundreds of neighbors to thousands of neighbors. So you'd have millions of conflict points. And, and now you're, you know, and each conflict point was represented by four or eight bytes according to whatever presentation you're using. And suddenly you're looking at many, many megabytes for just the live range data structures. Yeah, on, on average, we are more aggressive than C2 uh, around inlining. Oh, okay. But uh, even in OpenJDK, there was recently a change to increase, I think the max inline depth or something like that. Oh, max That's inline is different and it should be, it should have been increased a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, like in the recognition that, okay, the, the code now is different. It spans more like, yeah. Uh, yeah. I was compiling, I was coming from a C compiler head and looking at inlining produ productively in C compilers. And no one cared to go past four or five. It just wasn't going to win anything. And then, you know, in Java, it was, I saw a lot more before I left. And it was cheap to bump if you're inlining small accessor related things. So I bumped it to like nine, 10. And then, you know, ah, it's good enough to code at the time. And now, yeah, I, I imagine you'd want it to be at like 20. But you have different cutouts for like size. You still do frequency based and size based, and I see a bunch of constants like null pointer checks and shit based. Mm. That, that all still pays out. But if it's small and kind of directly related to the guy above it, and you know, a little modestly hot, uh, small is pretty cheap to inline. Inline. It don't care how deep it goes. So yeah, we, if we you've got someone doing Scala deep functional yeah. things, yeah. like. Well, we, we gradually move to a more aggressive functional style of code, so we need more aggressive. Yeah, yeah, a lot even of even Java of moves, even Java moves for more functional. Yeah, all all over the place. It's not just. I mean, the, the coding style has changed since I did the original C two, and more inlining makes more sense. Yeah, and that is why the modern Java or Scala code is usually showcases for compilers like Graal or Falcon, where we have opportunities to optimize more. 
Because if you take spec JVM, like, yeah, they all show more or less the same performance. And yes. like, yeah. so do we think we've made a mistake? Are our developers actually more productive now? Or if we had written more C style code, would our compilers be tortured less and our developers be more productive? No, I think that we've made progress. I think expressibility, the goal of the compiler is let you to write the code in the way that you want to and still get performance. I think the thing that we lost is the mapping from the code you write to the performance you get. And, and there are things that people do that cost them a lot of performance that they just have no fucking clue. Mapping changed. We yeah. didn't lose it. It's just ah. a different mapping. Uh, no, uh, there's a whole generation, maybe two now, <laughs> a little great no, here, where we've lost they the mapping. couldn't express what the mapping had been or was or is. They didn't understand there was a concept to the mapping. I, I would talk <laughs> to a lot of folks that just didn't grok where their time went and why. Yeah, they, yeah, they, I, they didn't I even grok that they, there, there was a mapping from code to time. Yeah, it's that's gone. Cliff, you're right. I mean, that's gone. I mean, you talk to people now and they just, they, they don't understand what's going on in, anymore because they write code, but what it, the mapping's gone. The mapping's gone. That. Okay. And now that's that, a little better state than saying, I don't even understand there's a mapping. <laughs> yeah. Well, they don't even understand there's a mapping. And not only okay. that, the profilers that they're using to try to understand what's going on yeah. interfere with the mapping. Yeah. So yeah. you don't even get a clear picture of what the mapping is when you're profiling yeah. what you think is quote unquote the mapping. Yeah. To Aaron's question, to Aaron's question, you know, trying to go back to, you know, when we built things in C, it's just silly. Like yes. you can't build things in C. Not <laughs> not today's, not today's things. No, Cliff, you, you can't. Like you do a, a UI like for any app on your iPhone, pick it, pick an app on the iPhone and you build that UI and see, go ahead. How long is yeah, it gonna take? Yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't now, necessarily Now, wait, 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 okay. wait. Now, you wanna build a big one. So go find 150 people of your caliber who can help you build that big app, right? And there's, there's not 150 <coughs> in the world, right? Like, that's the problem, like. <laughs> So the like, JVM like, got built in C and it was a big complicated hairy beast. And I, you know, I, I claim that, that uh, Arthur at least must be pounding out miles of C or C++ code. All right, so let's be fair right. though. No, that's not that a fair was, comparison. That was probably one of the greatest engineering companies in the history of the world. Sun Microsystems, <clears throat> Sun Microsystems couldn't manage their way out of a paper bag. Yeah. They couldn't market their way into a paper bag. Yes. <laughs> but when it came, when it came to getting good engineers, something worked. Right? They, so they got like, some good shit out of there. Yeah, no question. Well, I would add I mean, that. how many how many teams have Guy Steele and James Gosling and Arthur Van Hoff yeah. and you know John Rose? No, and they, you know, it's like Holy yeah. frick, like they you just don't find it. And now yeah. compare it, compare it with a company with infinite budget, Microsoft. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And look at the look at the CLI CLR team. I mean, they had three superstars and a couple hundred nice people. Yeah, I know. I I've talked I, to them a bunch <laughs> in the past. They kept trying to hire me in. I was like, you guys. Got okay, guys, you need to be careful now, right? Sorry, Kirk. I know you work for Microsoft. Now. <laughs> ah, ah, I didn't know but, that. But but I mean, but to the point, right? I mean, we're looking for JVM engineers now. There and you go. Do you think you can find them? I, I you know, I, I have a billable oh, hourly right. rate. Oh, I, right. I, I'll give you an annual rate if you want. Um, <laughs> it won't be small, but I know something about JVMs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So first off, they like somebody like yourself, Cliff. They don't value. Right. Wow, then, Whatever your then, annual rate is going to be, which you're, which I'm not going to say you're worth it or not worth it, you know, guaranteed are, but you're just not going to get anything near that, um, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. If they're not going to pay the rate, then that's that's all fine again. I'll go my way. You go yours. Right. And 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 then if you look at the, yeah, and then and then if you look at you know the ability to attract JVM engineers. Yeah, because right? a lot of companies are doing it because they want out of the support contract. Much easier to hire an engineer yeah. than it is to get to pay Oracle. 
and, yeah. and you get better support. Yeah. Um, but, you know, try finding them. You're just not there. I mean, there's like 25 slots open at Amazon right now. All Anybody right. want 350 a year? And uh, an Amazon work environment? There we go. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe a little more than that, but. What's that? So I, I charge a little more than that, but maybe. Oh, yeah. The annual, you know, maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I've had some fun stuff. Mostly I want to be fun stuff now. So, so I mean, and, and if you look at it, even if you put like super shit hot, um, like developers like yourself on it, you're nowhere near as productive in that language as you are in others. Oh, and C? Absolutely not. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, no kidding. No kidding. It, uh, yeah. That, well, there's some stupid things going on here that would make my life a lot more productive than some of these other languages. So C has an advantage that I can get into the details when I need to with low frictional overheads. And of course it has the obvious disadvantage of a bunch of like, you, you didn't get any support from memory management. Fucking you're right the memory management though. So JVM. I, I would love to have stronger typing. Well, so I can't write a JVM in a JVM yet. Um, you know, one of, the, one, of the, one of the far distant goals for AA is to be able to self-host. And still get you know JVM like productivity and stability and safety and shit, but I think I have a clue on how to self host it. But I wouldn't necessarily, you know, the the, the what happened with Grawl and the Java OS Java VM thing looked at it. You're looking at it. They they never made it work, not in any serious way. And Matt, you could throw that comment into the docs on the chat. We are, to some we are. extent, you can play the fourth like game of. I have a Firth interpreter, which is slow, but I use it to build assembly code that is fast. And then I call that. Right. So they, they started out with doing some super simple version of subset of Java and then trying to build up to a JVM, but they never somehow crossed the right threshold to get it to be productive. And I, you know, Java by itself lacks the low level access to necessarily do a garbage collector in yourself. So there's something else you need to do to do a self-hosting game. So there's a version of a JVM that you wrote that says, I don't do any garbage collection. I run fast until I die, but you'll die too quick. So now you need a Malik and free and you need a bunch of low level management shit. And what is this language buying you if it doesn't have garbage collection and it has better type systems, but immediately followed by, I can break all the type rules because I have to cast pointers to raw memory and do shit, right? And, and so I don't know what the right trade-off there is, but I don't know, like Rust sounds like a little better trade-off than, yeah. than Java for building a self-hosting stack on, stack yourself up thing. Yeah, oh, but at the, at the same time, there is Substrate VM as part of Graal project. And yeah, but so, where, where is it? Uh, well, the, the, the quality of it and the properties of it, yeah, it's it's a different story. It like is not it, it's not as performant as Hotspot. It uses it's a like it's a different niche. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm claiming why not, or I'm asking why. What is the language that you would write and implement a JVM in these days? So Cameron uh, had a different point, which was if I was going to do a GUI, I wouldn't use a JVM necessarily to do a GUI. I could, but you know, I wouldn't use C. So I wouldn't use C to do a GUI. That one's kind of like painful. Or so, anything related to the web. Other than building the web server itself, you're not going to write it in C. And in fact, maybe. I would argue you'd, you'd probably yeah. get better performance in Java, not because Java's faster, but because yeah. you could actually focus on the things that make IO slow. Make, make it faster, yeah, right. Yeah. You get it up and running faster. I've certainly done web servers in Java and gotten them somewhat higher performance than the usual ones you can find floating around. You, know, you handle millions of operations a second without any trouble. Yeah, exactly. But on my, on my fucking notepad thing, my, my $50 Adam notepad would handle millions a second. Fine. Um, whatever. Yeah, so I'm sorry. I asked a question, I thought you were saying something about, oh, implement a JVM. What language? What would you pick? Anybody. Yeah, I think I think for for things like GC, yeah, I agree that using like self-hosted Java would be strange. You would need to do a lot of tricks to do this kind of low-level operations. Call your uh, stack. Yeah, I I think Rust is interesting, although I haven't written anything uh, serious in it. But uh, having a strict compiler is uh, like I like this idea. But at the same time, there are a lot of things in the JVM 
which can be written in a more high level language, for example, Java. I think writing a compiler in Java is not a bad idea just because, yeah, you're doing graph manipulations, having a GC is convenient and uh, yeah. yeah. Other things like, I don't know, verification also, why not write it in Java? Yeah, that one I agree with. I'm writing AA in Java right now, fine. That I, so I'm, I'm, I'm voting with my feet on that one. You could yeah, argue I should the, be using Kotlin, but I don't want to yeah, change I it mean, your, your memory management work is, is going to be done in C and assembly. And that's pretty much it. I mean, it may be C++, but it's not really C++. It's, right. That, no, my, my take on AA here is that I want to have easy hooks into assembly so that I can play some kind of a game with self-hosting and, you know, like I said, call your stack. Okay, that's pretty low level. Um, so, where do I go from there? Well, we've certainly seen paired language environments. So Python is usually the most of your code is in Python and stuff that's performance critical is in C or C++. Yeah. For yeah. Node, the stuff, most of what you write is in JavaScript and the stuff that's performance critical is in C or C++. And for Dino, you write stuff in JavaScript and the performance critical stuff is in Rust. So we have seen a community coming out of like, what is this two language, one language for things yeah. that are performance critical and one language Although for I, things I, that are developer productivity critical. So you are saying you are putting this boundary to be like performance critical, but I think with a like with a good just in time compiler, uh, I I would say that it's the boundary will not be the performance critical because like I trust right. the, the JIT I build, I I like the the quality of the code it produces, but doing things like garbage collection, where it's just very inconvenient to do it in your high level language without access to like raw memory. Um, so the, I, I would just put this boundary slightly different. Yeah. I think these guys switched performance in C because they couldn't get it out of their core language. But I think Eric was right. That the boundary is, you know, manipulating pointers is difficult in these other languages and straightforward in C, but crawling your stack is not a thing that you can even talk about in most languages. There's no, there's no way to get your, and, and of course a garbage collector must crawl the stack. So, so what, I, you know. So what uh, specific advantages do you see in having AA uh, self-hosted? Is there an advantage for using C for, I'm sorry? Uh, what advantage do you see in self-hosting AA? Oh, I just want to have the ability to do so. Like, is all the universe saying that only C is self-hosted and everyone builds from C. Is there no other way to move forward in life than to have a self-hosted C compiler and then you stack on top of that? So being able to self-host is totally a, a, a I want to call it a, a, a vanity project. Yeah, yeah, there's a, a something right. goal here. It's a, you so know, C is called goal. sometimes lovingly, <laughs> sometimes derogatorily portable assembly. Yeah, right. And to some extent, if you don't want to self-host your thing on C, you're going to end up writing an entire subset of AA that is typed assembly AA and I'm, have to I'm go through that. Right. I'm okay with some portion of that. So there's some portion that says that the AA I'm writing here is going to one-to-one -one map to machine code. And there's some portion here that says, I'm just going to call it assembly, but it's typed assembly so that I have some reasonable type safety floating around and I get some compiler support, but I'm writing assembly now. I'm you know, hey, hey, going to town. Um, and then at some point I'm going to say, and here I do unsafe, you know, like what Russ says or whatever, I throw down the keyword unsafe and I do something, you know, bizarre, uh, you know, like take my return address off the stack because I took the stack pointer plus eight or minus eight or whatever your x86 protocol is that varies from ARM to any other chip to every, wherever. And I'm doing a thing because now I can crawl the stack. Crawling stack means I have to have meta knowledge about what my stack looks like and so on and so forth. So there's a thing there that I would love to have compiler support for, but does involve doing operations that are not nameable in other languages. So do you have a sense of how little typed assembly you can have in your self-hosting AA? I don't know. You know, loads and stores where the addresses and the offsets represent fields are like a cheap version. So I don't have to dance in and out of AA and assembly to talk about AA data, you know, Java objects, AA objects. 
But then there are things that are outside of those bounds that I, I can maybe get range checking done or I can claim with one whack of unsafe that now I'm looking at a stack pointer, which I'm gonna treat like an array. And at least I get range checking on the array, um, but the actual stack contents are like, you know, not, they have a funny mapping to state of the universe that's not obviously typable in any way. And so I give up all the type safety at that point, and, you know, go to town. Like, like the standard GC stack crawl demands that your thread not be mutating the stack. So you have to lock your stack. Locking the stack can be done outside of the stack. You still need some atomic operation somewhere. But then at this point, the thread who got a stack lock has to ask permission to crawl his own stack or to walk his own stack to unwind out of it or whatever. And so there's some operations are just not, I don't know, maybe, maybe that one's expressible too. And more often it's about the how easy you can express some kind of idea, some kind of concept. Right. Because in compilers, the concepts are much more important at first. And then you, yeah. if you have to drop to a lower level to optimize it as well as you could. So one of the things that Hotspot did, I think worked out really <clears throat> well. I certainly didn't come up with the idea, but it's super good, was the notion of a stack frame as a sort of arbitrary abstract concept. And there was a next frame and an end of frames and a, and a first frame. And then within a stack frame, you had metadata mappings to hardware where you would say, this is a Java stack frame. It has the following locals. I can go ask the metadata and it'll tell me it's in this register, but I can also go then ask the stack frame above or below, where did you spill this register? And there was a way to abstractly crawl through registers and spill code and pre and prologue and epilogue things and and literally do for all stack frames in the stack. And that mapping at a high level was really convenient and I would love to keep that in AA. But somewhere in that mapping, there's a pointer to an abstract thing, which is somebody's machine hardware stack. And then I can find all the pointers that way by for all and ask the pointer question and then update them. And, you know, there's some atomic thing you always did before you unlock that said the, the updates you did had to tickle the hardware specifically. So the guy whose thread, whose stack you just crawled would recognize your rights because he wants to cache his stack aggressively. And this is true on both windowed and non-windowed architectures you know, an x86 knows something secret in its heart of hearts about its stack contents. And, uh, you know, you have to do a, you have to do a hard x86, you know, whatever memory fence whack on the head to make him let go of his secret knowledge when he's going to call a stack. You got a Spark with Windows, you got an Azul chip with Windows, you got a Titanium chip with Windows, you did an equivalent thing where you whacked a guy. So the notion that you need to whack a guy is a high level abstract notion. The actual instruction you used varied from hardware to hardware. And so you wanna have that split between, there is an abstract notion, if I modify your stack, I have to teach you that your stack's been modified. Um, and then- So you've ported the JVM a few times. Yeah. What would you want out of that architecture to make it so porting to a new system was less painful? Um, because you mentioned you can push a lot of it up into AA. That means right. Less porting. So, so over time, the the JVM got a lot more portable. Like the first port from x86 to Spark was a nightmare, um, because everyone thought they had portable code right up until you discovered that yeah, it had never been ported. Yeah. Um, every old C program will tell you that one. It's it's portable when it's been ported like a dozen times. Um. We kept finding rat holes and this and that. And so many, many rewrites later, it got kind of portable for an expert. Um, I wasn't the only guy porting it. Um, knowing what I know now, I would make sure to have a place to put portable abstract access, the, the mapping from an abstract concept to the machine concept in a particular place. And I'd be willing to throw things in there pretty early and kind of aggressively and move the boundary a little bit. But you know there's going to be an abstract concrete boundary. And in some places, only one chip needs this particular kind of a boundary piece. 
it's still useful to make the boundary because in general, when other people don't care there, they actually do, they've abstractly walked across that particular boundary at some point as well. They just didn't need to do anything about it when they walk the boundary. But the knowledge that you walk that boundary is useful because it marked a sort of a state machine making progress. Like garbage collector does a stack crawl to mutate the stack. There's a thing that said, I need to grab a stack frames lock, a stacks lock, so the running thread can't mutate it. I need to, uh, having grabbed it, I need to make him flush out any mutations he's done that he's cached in his hardware and won't be visible in shared memory. I now need to go ask where he landed. So I have to grab program counter, stack pointer, where I got the lock at. I now need to uh, 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 crawl stack frames for all stack frames using those initial SP PC pieces. That's what you need. So that's a funny thing, but that I know that now. And that's the only thing you need, but that's what you need. And then you crawl to the end, do your thing where you look at the guys and you whatever. And that's the piece that wants to be fast and efficient. So usually the stack crawls wait on running threads is way to the last second and it wants to get out of the way as fast as it can because that's your GC pause. So you've already pre-cooked all this shit and you've got that particular pass where you lock the guy and crawl it and change it and lock, unlock it. You've got that made to run really fast by doing all this pre-work. So you generally have special data structures. You've accumulated all your changes in one place and you're ready to, ready to just do the job and get out of the way. Then you do the job and then you have to go back through and you know, tickle the guy to say, okay, you know, reload your stack and then go. Unlock the lock. And along the way, there was a whole lot of abstract steps I did that I want to have marker points and I want to have, you know, uh, uh, an abstract mapping equivalent off in the machine portable side. And, you know, I heard lock my stack. I heard flush your windows out. I heard flush them back in. I heard get an initial SPPC. And then there's like eight or nine more. Some of these machines, that's a no-op. You know, x86 doesn't necessarily need flush out. Um, because he has a strong model, but, but you do have to flush in. So, you know, it's empty on some machines and not empty on others, but it's useful to know. And here the stack is coherent across threads. So across cores, not threads, cores. So another core can read this guy's stack and so on and so forth. So yeah, there's a lot of history learning there to make a portable stack crawlable garbage collectible thing. You know, if I wanted to do a Raspberry Pi GC that also worked on a hotspot x86, there's some shit you do there. Same thing for inline caches, which is self-modifying code. There's a five state state machine that's running, uh, can be modified to, from any of the five states to almost any of the others, because one of the state transitions requires a full GC cycle, but most of the state transitions can happen anytime by any thread at any point. So you need to know, I have self-modifying code. There are rules on its alignment where it lands in caches so I can do updates. There's code to patch from one of the five states to the next. There's tests you do to read the code so you can validate what you think its current state is when you're reading machine code to validate the state. There's an OOP in there, Barry, to do a, a inline cache you know, key compare check. There's a code address to jump to buried in there. You have to be able to fetch out, modify, and put back those pieces all atomically. Um, and again, so the ABI that's machine specific picks up another 15, 20 calls there for doing an inline cache. Um, I would lump them all on the inline cache side of things, but you know, there's a thing. Um, inline caches make V calls, you know, super cheap. So it's super useful to do. There's the inline version of the subclass check. Uh, it's a little different than inline cache, but it's kind of close. Again, you end up with five or six couple states and a couple entry points where you want to mutate things atomically that are in the code. So you have self-modifying code hacks that vary from architecture to architecture. So it sounds like there's basically going to be three layers. I go to a new system. I have to write the typed assembly, to essentially these, parser well, yeah. for oh, yeah. that particular typed assembly yeah. for that particular chip. Then I have to implement the hardware abstraction layer yeah, in that typed point. assembly. Yeah. And then the top layer is just AI. And yeah. that stuff should all work once yeah, maybe in yeah. the bottom two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, like one of the port layers is um, generate machine code from the compiler for the jet. 
And I, those, those are the, the C2 version of that. I, I would never do again, but it was, you know, old school burrow free writing, instruction rewriting, whatever setup. Um, that one is, I would just use the assembler and demand that I could emit basically standard assembly code, except for I wanted to take an advantage of like addressing modes and shit. So there's a code gen instruction selection guy that does something a little different. Um, you have to describe the register set and register allocator. So your instinct is actually to produce assembly in the assembly language for that shit, not no. to produce the binary directly. No, I produce the binary directly. I would write assembly using a canonical assembly language syntax. So what I've done since, I don't know, somebody did it at, I want to show you Robert Rudmer. Somebody did it at Sun. And originally it was really x86 only. And then we kind of mutated to be x86 and Spark-like. And by the time I got to Azul, I made it canonically identical across everybody, except if you had addressing modes on an x86, there's a little diddle, that's a little different. No one else had addressing modes like that. Everyone did red plus offset. Uh, x86 got fancy. Um, loads and stores, branches, jumps, moves, compares, uh, those were all canonical format. So if you hand wrote it, you wrote shit that looked like assembly code, but in this canonical format style, and it worked on all platforms. But if you had to say, oh, I'm doing the interpreter dispatch loop a little bit differently from x86 versus ARM, and I wrote them, I was still writing the same machine code looking, the same assembly code, um, but maybe the actual encodings, not encodings, like I, the order of which I grabbed bits of how I, I broke out the dispatch loop was a little different between them maybe because rules is rules like x86 will do a misaligned load of a long thing if i have a multi byte bytecode i can misalign load it and it's all fine and if i'm an arm i have to do a, a byte at a time and then accumulate so yeah you're a little different here a little different there is fine um but you mostly wrote in the same canonical assembly style for everybody and then the the other rules got a little different so yeah, oh, you need CAS as a rule. That's a little different from folks. Yeah, but like I said there, there'd be there'd be. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you said there's three easy layers. There's write assembly code and generate the binary bits out. There's another piece. Actually, there's like there's be another piece you have to do, and that's describe it to the compiler. So that's all the instructions the compiler will ever emit, plus the register allocation and register instruction constraints. So that's a somewhat different because in the handwritten machine code, I always use my own hand done register allocator. So there was a mapping from an abstract register to a machine register, but that one was actually kind of canonical for everybody as well. I said RSP for register stack pointer and RPC and everyone agreed that they had this concept. So what it actually turned into under the hood, I didn't care. I could write RSP in the way I went. Um, I could do RAX or, or R some number plus offset in the assembly. And on the x86, I said, this R temp is really RAX. And on a, on a, on a Spark chip, this would be R1 or R3 or whatever. Yeah. So you could hide a lot of the naming of names of what the registers meant canonically. So that was fine. So what did I say here? Write a machine, write an assembler, write the compiler portable bits, which includes register mappings. Write all the self-modifying code hack bits, which are a little bit delicate for everyone. Write something to go access your stack and program counter bits. Um, we always needed an, a, an Indianness order for some stupid reason. Somebody cared about Indianness. Oh, which way your stack crawl cared? Somebody cared about which way your stack crawled. Um, I'm sure I'm missing 27 other things that show up when you get there, but you can understand there's a, there is a finite count and they're all kind of this weird fiddly interaction. Everything else, I think you can lift uphill and get them into an, you know, an AA slash Java base, you know, Java, what did Arthur, somebody has a name for the thing that was their project that never went. I, I think what you need for the pretty low level side is it's not infinite. Um, is it well broken out? I don't know. It is on the it, better on the Azul side. I spent a lot of effort before I left there, you know, cleaning that out. Uh, hey, Chris. Long time no see. 
Um, yeah, sorry. I mean, it's it's late here. It's basically dinner time, so my wife is already like, "Why why do you join now?" <laughs> well, you haven't joined in a long time. Yes, yeah, you have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have the same problem in a different domain here. Chris, long time we'll see. Yeah, that's true. You got uh, any news it's... to add? Sure, I'm trying to change topics now. <laughs> No. What are you what are you doing these days? Um, well, still working on my own startup. Excellent. <laughs> well, it depends on if we get the next funding round. Um, that, that will tell us if it's excellent or not. Well, typical startup issue, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, and I'm yeah. certainly missing traveling. Uh, it was, it it was nice. to get cash flow positive. Yeah. Huh? I, I it takes a while to get to cash flow positive. Yeah, well, that is true. Well, and, and for a year or so, it was nice to to not travel too much. Uh, but I start I actually started to to really miss it now. Well, but I it am, is what it is, right? <laughs> I am so ready. I am so ready to to travel again. Yeah, yeah. I guess yeah. everyone is. We we are planning J Crete. So ah, excellent. <laughs> Well, you, you, you tried for the last two years, right? I think this year it'll go. Yeah, I think so. You got any kind of a, a, a date going on that? Uh, we have we have we have a date. It's uh, the week of uh, July twenty fifth. Okay. How 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 <laughs> sure are you? Like, am I buying tickets now, or are we uh, we negotiate? Stuff? <laughs> Don't buy tickets right yet because we've had another conference want those dates, and Heinz was thinking of giving them up, and I don't want to. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Right? So, so you and Heinz are still negotiating what? Yeah, what it means. Well, okay. if we give up those dates or not. So okay. those are the dates that we have, um, and then it, it's the question of do we switch to the week that includes the uh, well, the date I'm trying to avoid is the fifteenth. So I, which I believe is a Friday. Uh, so, yep. Yeah. Okay. You said but, July 27th, 25th? My birthday. Just put a, just put a blocker, a potential yeah, yeah, yeah. blocker. I got the prior week down. <laughs> I'm putting the next week down as well. We'll, we'll figure it out. Okay. Yeah, cool. uh, we'll, we'll know shortly because we're, we're still, uh, it depends on who says, who gives in first, but I have, um, I have more support in my corner to keep okay. it on the, on, the, on the other week. So, okay. Where? How do you import? Never mind. I'll get it sorted out here. I'm trying to get Chris. Chris is into the spreadsheet. He hasn't been in so long. You dropped off my chart. It's all good. <laughs> all right. What else? So, uh, AA update. Oh God, all week on approximation. Finally, finally boiled down to like um, old, old school graph theory for doing a prox. Like I, 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 I think I can do a really inefficient version of a prox fairly straightforwardly. And I probably should just write it for assertion checking. Like one that's like exponential in time, like a gross thing. Um, but the, the, the one that runs sort of linear in the size of the thing being approximated, uh, you know, I, I went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And I kept finding, refining the same fails 14 times over in, in a cleaner and cleaner abstraction. So I have an even cleaner abstraction for how to write the thing, but the actual ordering and, and when you can do the, the, how you do the prox bits and where, where they show up has become like this, this old school graph. It's like, um, you know, some, some blend of strongly connected components and Im immediate dominator tree algorithms to do it in one pass. The, the good news is I have test cases now, I think cover all the extremes of what the horrific games you can play with. And the lattice doesn't save you from that complexity because you need to know what the approx is to know what nodes are in the lattice. Yeah, basically. Yeah, th this is the lattice in the sense that I want to not have something grow indefinitely. So, you know, the point of approx is to shrink while preserving monotonicity. But um, it must, but it must give up at some at some point. 
it has to give up it approximates that's the give up but when do you give up and how and what kind of give up do you do and and you know like i said i've i've, I've, I've upped my tooling a fair amount now i have much better pretty printers for dealing with cyclic and redundant graphs so ascii only like cyclic graph printings with the leaves part broken out and the cycles and the reuse part broken out um, so that's good we are gravitating to a graph theory again. It's been graph theory for the lattice for a long time. Yeah, graphs are pretty useful concepts. Yeah, like, like it took me forever to get meat correct hmm. when I have cycles. In the absence of cycles, yeah. you do structural recursion. It's fucking trivial as hell. Everyone knows yeah. how to do structural recursion, you're done. As soon as you have cycles, it's, a, it's kind of a nightmare. <laughs> to so, what extent does the behavior of a prox bleed back into code? Well, like, could you, someone make a micro AA that has really aggressive approximations and someone else have a precise AA that has really fine and still run the same code? Um, I haven't been using the flow types to bleed back into what is well. That is what I'm trying to use to figure out what is well typed AA. So the 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 rules on a prox are are well basically those haven't changed it has to has to be an is a relationship floating around it has to shrink um that will turn into some amount of things that i'll be able to type or not type according to how aggressively and i don't know what that i don't know what that looks like so i'm going to stick with the original the, the first cut of a prox that i actually like is one that doesn't suck, but does and does preserve cycles. That's a big part of doesn't suck. And otherwise is as most approximating as I can get away with because that turns into the easiest possible understanding of what you get. Um, and so all these things that have self recursive code that run on forever and you guys seen so I can pull some out again. They turn into like really gnarly looking AA types and they're well typed. Um, but you could argue that I didn't care for that much precision in that. Uh, and I could, I could, I could, you know, work with a little less precision there and it'd be all fine. When is it helpful? It's helpful when I'm usually, when I'm using the types to constrain what Henley Milner would otherwise do. Like the Henley Milner side has been working for a while. I got a lot of, a lot of add-ons to Henley Milner. They're all working fine now. Um, the, the, if I want to say something even better than what I get out of the Henley Milner side, I need the flow types. And the obvious thing I think it will win big on, I guess the two ones are if you're dead, you don't count for Henley Milner. So it's a better way to deal with dead code uh, at typing time. And the other obvious one is I get a strong call graph. And I haven't figured out how that can be used to make Henley Milner better, but it seems obvious to me that it should. So, you know, this is the strong call graph is basically you didn't actually call here from there. So you fucking don't care that the types align or they don't, they do or they don't align. You skip some unification steps and Henry Milner, and that would get you, you know, better ability to type things that you would otherwise say are unrelated or not typeable or whatever. So there's something going on there. I haven't sorted out yet what it means to what a, a better worship prox does for what AAs I can accept or not. I kind of sort of think that it'll mostly show up at a module boundary where I know that you didn't escape the module. Uh, you have an internal function that you never escape. So it doesn't have to be typable by the rest of the universe ever. And so I can just hide it away. There's, there's a stronger notion of what it means to be in or out of a module. That's, that's my to current guide, guess is what it does. To guide the type system. Yeah, yeah okay. right. Well, well, the other yeah. if you return a type, that's part of your API. That's just true. Right, but if you return a function pointer, and you, you demand that function pointer, and I have a pile of functions that match the signature of the function pointers returned, do they all get returned? Does the other guy get to call them? Can they be called from everybody else on the planet? Well, it turns out if they never escaped because my call graph tells me they didn't then I don't have to care that they get called by everybody else or not, even if it looks like the same type of thing might get sent out and then get called by somebody else. So I know that it can't, because I know that it can't, I can be more aggressive about what I type it. 
which means you can be you know more aggressive about how you use it because you can know something that says yeah no one else is going to call this sucker anyhow so like yeah but you don't care can it lead to a situation then it's typed one way because nobody calls it but then the codes begin to call it it needs have to type it again if, if i yeah if if within this closed universe module you have some function that you didn't put any types on and i inferred and i got something yeah. that worked and i'm yeah. all happy and you're happy and we live life later oh. you took this function that's inside that i inferred and you exported it mm -hmm. okay now somebody else cares what it looks like and the other guy will come along and say i did this and in your head you had it typed this way but the compiler came up with that type Mm -hmm. And the, that type the compiler came up doesn't match what the caller called it as. And so you get an error. And mm -hmm. now you can either not export it or you can, you know, agree that you want it to be the way you think it ought to be typed. And as soon as you put down annotations, no, no, it was really this kind of a thing. The compiler will then say in your module, you, you got a yeah. conflict there, dude. You said that yeah. you wanted a, a point of X, Y, and Z, but you're passing me non-point objects, but they have X, Y, Z, so I'm all happy, but they ain't points. And you're demanding a point. The other guy demands that it be a point class function, but it's not a point function. It takes any X, Y, Z and does something. I mean, I don't know. I'm making up something on the fly, but yeah, that's yeah. the kind of thing would happen, right? You're locally consistent internally. As soon as you export it, now you have to be consistent externally. And what was the type that the external guy got out of that? Well, okay, now, now you have a conflict. Oh. It almost makes me imagine a kind of interesting test suite where you're like, okay, go to the AA package index and download everything that imports me. And when uh, I make this change, retype me against everything that has ever imported me. Did I make a backward incompatible change for the code that exists yeah, in the world? Th th that would be kind of a standard thing. I would think that would work for anybody though. That's just not AA, that's anybody, right? Like if, if I do any type differencing at all and I change how a function behaves, I, I, you know, and, and there's a public repository. It's a public function. Uh, maybe people do public functions. I see. I'm kind of thinking if I do a public function, a module boundary, I'm going to demand types. You're yeah, going the to language have I have in mind is that's very hard to do with Python. Ah, that's true. Because and, you and actually have to point. run the test suites of everybody in the world who imports you. You can't just say, hey, do yeah, a type right. analysis against everyone in the world who imports right. you. Right. Because... I'm, I'm currently of the opinion that you modules should have strong types. Hmm. Yeah, that would and, be a good and then, and then it doesn't matter. If you change the module signature, you know, you know you're making a breaking change. Okay, fine. Be because you're not required to type it, uh, then the structure of the code will be become more complicated because it have to invent all the types, because it have to retype it everywhere because you don't have a types. And if you have if you have some boundary that you know the type, the user demands the type, and yeah. it's easier to yeah, I, I can segregate the typing problem with the boundary mm. layer. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what I'm, you know, one of the reasons to go there. You, so as soon as you said, I'm now exporting this function, I even, would say, even though the module signatures he, on it because it got exported. Yeah. Even though Hindley Minor does not require you to type things, doesn't yeah. mean you. You shouldn't. Just, yeah. You should, yeah. you should not. That's right. That's right. Mm. No, I'm trying to reach this point because see if I fucking can and see what makes a difference. Yeah. And, because. And then because because uh, uh, it lets you do write like small snippets of code where you just inline every but thing yeah. and passing. Yeah, because I'm coming from, from from a Scala background, I kind of like types. I kind of, because they're, as I said, they're better documentation. When you see the type, you immediately know how, what range of values you operate. The problem is when, when you have to express the bigger types, you have to come up with some wildcards, some stuff Scala come up with. Or right. That's, that's become cumbersome. That's yeah. when it becomes Well, cumbersome. Java gets wildcards and, and less than, greater than things mm. or whatever, the question mark yeah. star. And it's just like, crap, now it's hard to understand. Yeah. It's hard to read. Yeah. It's hard to write. And mm. the compiler's going to fucking, you know, infer it anyhow. Like, what am I here for? Yeah. Yeah. And you... We have to have some way to explicitly demand the type because hey, to ensure. I have to, I have to, I have to poke fun at Mark because you mm. have the frowniest frown, whatever you're doing. Looking at, at some bad code. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots and lots of statics. Do you have my sympathies? Sorry about that. This is, this is the. the <laughs> it's not you know, your statics. 
this is the, the point Kirk was making about hiring me at Microsoft. I would first come in and say, you guys have done something horrific here. This is uglier than sin. You have to pay me gonna, double gonna to clean up with your ugly 40 gun. years of, of work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine. So what I do kind of like the idea of I'm tweaking two libraries that interact a lot and it's relatively forgiving until I say, all right, do a release build. And it's like, uh, okay, actually you need to define this yeah. thing at the end. And by the way, here's a diff of what you would have to put in as the type here that I have inferred, but actually put this particular line of code in this particular file at this particular spot and then I'll let you release could it. Come up with those, that's straightforward. Like when I have a type, I have a pretty printed version of it that I can ingest. Or I oh, yeah. should. I'm Your error should. that says, hey, you can't do a release build because you have an inferred type at the perimeter, you can tell them. Here's no, what no, we that inferred one, that the one, type I, I think should. That's the whole module boundaries. This thing is now part of your module boundary. And you didn't give me a, a module type on it. Right. But I would like to be able to run a debug build where I have two libraries that are actually interacting with each other because I'm mutating oh, them I see. in parallel. And only when I say, okay, release time, that it says, no, ah, you cannot oh, issue a release. Okay, fine. That's no, fair. no packaging this up as a release. You have an right. inferred type at the perimeter. That's, that's fair. That's fair. I can do that. And that totally makes sense to me. So what kind of abstraction do you envision for a something like an interface because for interface, a module boundary? yeah yeah for a module, you know, some kind of ability to abstract because you if you are not required to write the type then you have an interface with some methods that no, you no. Have you, you, you are required to write the type at the module boundary unless mm. you're in this mode like like to make a module release i demand a module boundary uh, uh, oh, types. okay. You you'll yeah. say you have to give me the type. So that... You have to uh, the module boundary, and that's just for documentation mm -hmm. on the module. Whereas if you're doing just what what uh, Aaron was saying there, and I'm debugging some situation, I don't ask for a module. I'm just taking the module code, and I'm running mm -hmm. with this other module code, and I'm free and loose, and I'm screwing around till I get it all working. Then I say, oh, 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 I want a module, and then I'll complain. Yeah, but you exported the following thing. Give me a type for them, right? And then you get to the release version, which is you change your module signature, go look at the corpus and you know see who else is going to complain that you changed the module signature. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's probably would work. But the, the so, turn on or off the, the requirement yeah. to annotate types, it's a, that's all it turns into. Does a top level exported type need to have a human, handwritten annotation or not? Do people in this room have opinions on the relationship between, say, modules, files, folders? Oh, I do. Did you have to lay out your code in a folder to make it a module or put it all hmm. in one file to make it a module or just hmm. have some package equals name at the top of each file? So to, to mimic the, the challenge with this question is that the term module means different things in different languages. Yeah. And that, that so like you, you got to start with what you mean by module, because in some languages, the term module is actually synonymous with the term file. Yeah. So, true. Um, particularly if you go back to the 70s. So, the, you know, the concept of module was file. Well, let's go to a larger, you know, more modern, sorry, more modern version. You know, what does it mean module mean in the, you know, 2000s? Well, what does it mean conceptually? I think is a is a is a good question because you know we've kind of like the chosen, perimeter at which you must define your types. We've definitely chosen the wrong words for certain concepts. You know, I'll I'll give Java a big thumbs up here for package as an example. Um, but why but, it, uh, it, why it has to mimic the directory? Um, hmm. Okay, so I, I my theory on a module is it's a unit of separate compilation where I'm expecting an unrelated human to try and call it, call in through there. It's where right. a human- It's a bound, would... it's, it's a big boundary. It's a big boundary, <clears throat> yes. It's a galaxy or a solar system, right? Okay, you know, fine. Like it's a... Yeah, yeah, right. It's a big boundary. The big boundary, yes. And inside, um, I take a lot of shortcuts maybe. And yeah, single independent unit, yeah, fine. Um, and I'm expecting to change its internal behavior without frequently changing its external behavior so that the rate of change across the boundary is low so that people can live with it. 
So if you define the boundary that way, it acts some kind of interface with the public, yeah. with the yeah. public methods. The x86 and instruction set changes slowly so that we are not all borked every time Intel changes their mind on a particular mm -hmm. instruction. Okay. The language spec for Java changes slowly, so we're not all borked when the you know JVM committees decide that we we love or we're stealing the var as a keyword from the set of you know. So the way the way I define kind of the concept of modules is how you describe the unit. So it's a unit of compilation, not to say that you can't have a larger or a smaller unit, but it becomes a natural demarcation yeah. uh, for compilation. Yeah. Uh, it's a unit of reuse, which is what you meant by, when I say unit of reuse, what I mean is it provides APIs that permeate that boundary. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a unit of, of versioning. So you cannot version something within a module and you don't version something larger than a module, you version the module. Yeah, makes sense. That's, that's a and good, it's yeah. and it's and as a side effect. I mean, now you have questions of nested modules, but sure. Yeah, we'll get there. But no, no, that's that's still that's still reasonable in the in in the model I'm describing. And then it it becomes the version. Sorry, it becomes the unit of repository management. So if you're yeah. caching, if you're downloading, if you're, et cetera. That that's that's all, basically how I describe module. That's all things I agree with. I think that's that's a good good way to go. Right, but we could have used a different word. And we could have left module meaning, you know, file or a combination of well, okay. so Should it should this become a, a language concept or a, let's take for example Scala? It has a package object because it kind of uh, acts as an object. It encapsulates some kind of functionality, but you can manipulate it like an object. Yeah, some some languages actually what I just described as a module. Some languages call that a package. Hmm. Okay. So, so just okay. to be clear, that's why I was trying to be yeah. loosey goosey on on the, the religion around the words themselves. I mean, it'd be nice if we had settled on a concept and a word and all agreed on that. But yeah. So there's the, another aspect here, which is what is the file system relationship to the module? And I am kind of sort of of the opinion that the the module should start as a root point of a tree of files. And I kind of care less about how they look inside, but there is some root point of a file system. And then there's some parts that make up a module that would be within the subtree underneath. Um, and because cause it's just so much more convenient to deal I'll with. Post in, I'll post in a paste in a link. Um, and so uh, would you be interested in allowing relative file system paths to bleed into code? Um, Import dot, it, dot slash sibling. Would, Within a module, what do you mean by import? <laughs> within a module, relative makes a lot of sense. Certainly, in the client of Java, your package is a point in the file system, and you have relative names in the packaging itself, and that goes straight to import and all those other operations. Um, Chris is saying like a file per class, which I kind of do too. I'm kind of what a class means in AA is a little different than it is in other languages. In particular, all my classes are actually anonymous. You give them a name if you want to or not if you don't. So maybe it doesn't make sense. You have tiny classes that just live in a little tiny piece and never escape. And never right, but you can't extend AA naturally because it has structs as essentially objects. The structs it would be relatively easy to say, when I import a file, Whatever is the last thing in the file, that's the thing that I return to you. So I can just be like, make me a bunch of structs, put all those structs in a bigger framing struct. That's the thing that you got when you imported this file. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't sorted out. There, there's a thing there between what it means to import a file. Like the, the, in the land of Python, you execute every file. The act of execution uh, uh, returns the result as the last thing in the file which is typically the class spec because you started out by saying def, blah, 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 and whatever you went to town on. Um, I might go to that route. And that says that the when you import, you actually execute. And the, the what you get is the last value executed, which is commonly going to be a struct, which is the you know, class you're looking for. 
so so the other piece that's blending here is I, I don't make a distinction between structs and classes. So some people might call out a, a prototype model or something that the a struct is a class, a class is a struct for whatever I'm doing in AA, they all have the same synonymous. Name. My opinion would be to, if you import a file, if you import a package with the name of the file implicitly. Yeah, so, so now the Java world says I import a package piece, which I'm gonna find via file. And the Python world says I import a file. And, and, and does people have an opinion about that variation? Right. And in Python land, you say, get me, and you have some horrible spec that you get a file. And there's a bunch of headers about how the imports go and where you find things. And the problem I have with that is that the random way that you get a file turns into, I don't know what files are in. Same for um, JavaScript. I'm against the Java to package to mimic the directory. I'm, I'm just concerned with the name of the file. The name of the file becomes a package in, in, in the language. Yeah, but okay. So, so in the land of Java, in, in the file per class world, the, the file name and the class name have to be the same. Yeah. There's another version for you know, AA that says I have small local internal classes everywhere, structs everywhere, but there is one for this file that I'm returning as the one for this file. And, and you know, we'd like to believe that it's named according to the file, it has some as, variation on that. Yeah, as you, the name of the file would become the object which encapsulates all of the, it's the root of the object. Actually, of the... for AA, I would do, where's the damn thing? I would do like the, the normal rule I have is everything's a value and value for everything and everybody's anonymous. So if I want to make a, a, a class person that I'm going to get from somewhere, I would do a class definition where I want to have a type here, which is the import. And here I'm making up syntax, you know, Um, yeah, maybe it's just that import. That's we, good. Fine. We can and, share screen. Uh, yeah, let me do that. Uh, da, 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 zoom, zoom, share, blah, 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 Google Docs share. Yeah, here we go. Right. My instinct looking that line of code is that it is going to look in the same folder that you got loaded from for a folder named package yeah, and a file named person. The Java version looks a little more like this. It's not a string, it's a thing there. To actually actually just keep, keep piling in dots, you know. The Java version looks something more like that. Eh, I'm not fond. I could claim totally that I need a string here. I'm going to turn the string into a file system lookup, except that I'm going to demand not the word package, but like package root. And then I'll maybe even just say that it's, you're going to be relative to the package root. For sys.import, you're relative to the package root. You cannot go outside of the package. But you cannot go outside the, of the, the, the module's root. What's the benefit of being able to dynamically construct your import at runtime? Um, I don't know. Because, and, and maybe from it's my not. I mean, because I, from my perspective, that's the only difference. On right, our... right. I, I go back and forth on this one. Like I did, I see this in JavaScript all the time. It's some good, <laughs> some bad. Right, right, right. Well, there's a version of that that says I'm going to do my imports. So, so thematically for AA, since everything's anonymous and done by execution, a person type that you want to pull in from somewhere else is a thing that you would do with an assignment to a person thing, which means you gave a local name. Like there is no, there is no person, there is no class called person. There is only a field. The field is a type field that has a type value, it happens to contain a thing that behaves like a person. But in AA, there is no named types. There is no, not, I'm sorry, yeah, there's no named types. There is no named functions or classes. I say no named classes, it's better than no named classes. Um, instead, everything's anonymous, but I can have type variables 
but whatever name I give my type variable is whatever name I gave it locally in the current module I'm at. And whatever type it gets is the type it gets from somebody else who handed him the type. And now when I, so that means there's already a name disconnect between the name that you wrote when you were writing your code and the name that I called it when I imported it. That happens so in Python all the time. I see everyone has a shortcut. I have this long horrific, in, in Java I have it too. I say import com.cliffc.aa.blahblahutil. Except that because I've imported it by default, he, he shrunk the com.cliffc.aa.import away. And I just brought in my utilities library. But everybody has a version of the same thing where there's a long, fully qualified name and a short name. And, and here I'm giving you the short name, except that the default isn't always the name of the class. The default is whatever I wrote to the left-hand side of the assignment operator. So it's more like um, type alias. Yeah, yeah. It, it, so it's, the, decision, the decision we made is you can never reference something outside of your module, period. Yeah, right. that's, and then, and then I'm, I'm, I'm walking the line of headed down that path. I actually, the nice actually, thing about that is it then looks like a file system which starts with root and goes down, yeah. right? Yes. And there's in no, which, there's right. no in which cycles, case. so it's a, it's, it's a tree. It's a very carefully sculpted uh, DAG, right? Yeah, well, tree. You want a DAG? Yeah, tree. No, no, it's a tree. It's a tree, okay. And then, and then the cool thing is, you know, the way that you actually access other modules is you mount them into that tree. So you take an entire other module and you say that module is found under, you know, right forward slash whatever. Right. So it's kind For of like me, the it's mount. all under like the execution semantics. I just imported another type or another struct. Like the usual thing I was doing with modules, I'll probably be doing with modules, is I is I get a struct in. Since a struct is a class, is a struct is a class, I get a struct in or a class. And I assign it to a local variable, which happens to be called person in this case. And, and now I have a person class, which is just a struct. And I can make new instances of it. And I could do all the obvious right things that you expect out of this. So secretly under the hood, when I say I got a struct out, what it actually got out of here for a type variable is you've got a type for a called person. You have a constructor called person as well. Because I did a type assignment, I got a free constructor that has you know, it now picks up all the things you construct a person object with. Wait, but there's the most irritating code editor I've ever used. Oh, this thing? Oh God, yeah. It's, it's almost as bad as Word. <clears throat> um, I, it certainly seems more annoying than Notepad, which is pretty low in, like right. pretty low bar. So, so this is this this um, you know, module package class whatever. That's yeah. your that's your that's your tree, right? And if yeah. you want to pull in another uh, module, you have to mount it. So you say, you know, package P. Write some uh, comment that says that you're looking at XLC code in the front of you as opposed to AA. And I'll do the same here. You could copy it to the next code block. Um, this is potential AA. Well, we had to pay for those code blocks, so we don't want to waste them. Now, one hard and fast rule I discovered a while ago is that, um, that uh, whatever kind of import or package system you pick, um, if, it's, if it uh, requires keeping things in sync, it's probably, it's not, it's not a thing I want. So it's- If, if it's, yeah. I'm sorry, say that again? Uh, if it's if it keeps uh, multiple pieces in uh, if it requires keeping multiple multiple pieces in sync, it's usually not what I want. So oh, multiple instance, pieces in sync. Yeah. For instance, uh, if you say okay, um, I'm doing uh, my file system uh, um, describes the the package hierarchy, for instance, then the individual source files shouldn't need some additional package declaration. Ah, yeah. But if yeah, I'm doing I, a package declaration in each file, then where I place it on the file okay. system shouldn't matter. But the, I think the way Java does it, if right. like you have to have it in this uh, directory hierarchy, but also the package name has to fit is just, it's, it's right. useless. 
So, so the package name internally can be used to tell you where the root of your module is if you're nested in the tree. How do you get that information otherwise? If I'm in deep inside of a module and I'm editing some file and I want to go compile it, how does that file know, or does that file care to know what module it's inside? So we have a compile time this colon module, which gives you the module, but but, right, 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 right. So, so how, it, how do you, so you gave the module when you run the compiler? I'm, I'm asking yes, like JavaScript exactly, actually, exactly. You, you say dash class path kind of things, source and dest and shit like that. Say again. So in the land of Java C, sorry, I just got another person coming in late that I'm, I'm trying to, here he is. Uh, okay, the, the uh, when you compile a single file, does he care to know what module he's in? If he does, how does he figure out what module he's in? I said yeah, we walk up, we walk up the tree. Okay, I was going to go ask that question. One of the options is to walk the tree. Yeah, and you can yeah. demand the file system is laid out such that a tree walk works. And you find the module because it's called under another name that somehow you can relate in the file system hierarchy to know that it's the module for this whole setup. Yeah, the other I mean, thing is have a relatively to to simple refactor. rule, like crawl backwards till you find a folder with an init in it and read the module name out of that init. Yeah. Right, so that's well, one that says I have a special file name. That's the module marker name. It could well, be called uh, module, it could be, it could be in and dot yeah. mod. It could be, you know, there's a thousand ways it could or do it. Has, or has code inside it that says module. Okay, so then I, I look at every, when I walk up the hierarchy, at every directory I stop and I look at all the files involved and I read the first few lines to see one says module. If you look in the chat, I put a discussions link in there and that's that's what we changed from. We had module.x and that, uh -huh. was the, yeah. that was the name that you had to use for your module file if you had a tree structure yeah. that extended beyond one file. Yes. And um, and we loved it for two years, okay. two years, and then and it started it to get bad, to and then we started to really hate it, and now we switched it. And what is this one? This is the, uh, that's the current layout. So that, um, where it says ecstasy.x, and this is module file, that used yeah. to be called module.x, and then, oh, here. and then there was no ecstasy directory under that, or next to it. Yeah. So everything else was slid up one level, but now we've split it so that the instead of instead of reserving module.x and package.x as file names for those purposes, we now just lay it out hierarchically. But one of the reasons for the design is so you could take a package directory and just move it, and that would refactor it. Like you wouldn't, because because the challenge you have right now, you think if I move this, yeah, but don't I have to move this to go with it. Right, what I'm saying, like you could move that, you could rename that collections directory. Uh, oh, to, this uh, yeah, for example, you could rename the directory itself, though, is what I'm saying. Okay. And so you, and each file within it doesn't say, I am in, you know, ecstasy collections, you know, like, so there's no package yeah. statement at the yeah. top of right, every right, file. right. This is what Simon's asking for. It's separately, though, if I am inside of Boolean, I'm trying to get to list. You're trying to, right. I have so to know have that to, the name changed from collections to yeah. utilities or whatever. Right. So you would say import collections.list, which, yeah. When I renamed this directory from collections to utils. Right. You would have to change that code. Okay. That's, exactly. that's totally fair. I'm just trying to sort out what the, what the yeah. rule there is. Um, um, I don't like having this be outside of this. Why is that? Me? Which, why, say it again. Why is ecstasy.x a... Parallel to the ecstasy directory. Because there's, there's a ton of code in ecstasy.x. Is it? It's the module file. It's the module code. Yeah. Oh, no, you have code. In fact, in fact, I could actually put everything into that file if I wanted to. So I have a choice of what to split out. So yeah, uh, let me. Let me but are, okay, are these two names required to be the same? The ecstasy.x and the ecstasy directory. Yes, that, that's the convention, exactly. That is the convention. Okay, convention, so what happens but, if I define annotations in ecstasy.x, but I also have a file that is 
the folder exity slash annotations. If if there's a if there's two of the same name, one embedded and one split out, then it's a compiler error. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Yeah. I don't know that I like them in You would just say out the developer ambiguous name. Well, yeah, I, yeah, 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 you complain. You should you order oh. should or order. So, so the demand for a module is that there is a tree structure that's well formed that we all see agree the and love it. See the chat, see the chat link. Yeah, you want me to hit it here and we could take a look where you get your yeah. code. So this is a module. Oh, there it is. So yeah, so, I saw the module go by. Yeah. So module is just a class. Yeah. Right? Same just like a package is just a class. Now, yeah. you know, you don't have to actually write the code for a package. It's implicit. Um, for a module, you do because you have to give it a fully qualified name. Uh, well, you don't have to, but uh, most people will. So you know, you can see from the name that it'll be able to find it on the internet. You know, it uses a DNS uh, style naming convention and it nests classes inside of it so the module is the root is yeah. you know module is your forward slash yeah right your so, all your exceptions are in here it's not very big yeah all the simple stuff yeah i mean why would you have a file for three lines of code right so yeah. you can split out anything you want but you don't have to that was the yeah idea. still don't like the thought that it's parallel and not one inside the other but fine I will make our choices different. Well, that's that's the way we had done it before. Was that we had module dot x, yeah. and then and then you had yeah. annotations right next to it. Right, and you right. didn't like that. I'm sorry. Why did you not like that? Uh, well, among other things, you know, you're searching for a file, and you hit you know command shift n and idea, and you have 400 modules module dot x files, and you have 6,000 ah. package dot x files. You um, wouldn't start mark, with. Are you still on Mark? The directory, and then, then start, and then say slash module.x. So the, the repetitive module.x is difficult to deal with. That, that makes some sense. Yes, for example. And the other thing is with this model here, you could actually have multiple modules in the same directory, and they wouldn't collide. So there's a, there's a benefit there. So in theory, under this, uh, in the same directory, I could have five different modules because each one uh, has its own. I, I would similar. I would claim. Oh, yeah, sorry. Chris is uh, asking a question there. Right. So the reason it's called Ecstasy X is because the module name is Ecstasy. I can actually have, there's two choices here. I could have named it Ecstasy X or I could have named it ecstasy.xtclang.org.x. Um, but the, 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 the file name matches the module name. And same for the packages. The file name matches the module name. Yeah. You said uh, like uh, the module is like a class. Can you instantiate uh, multiple instances of this module or this one? No, because object? a module is a static const. Uh, okay. So static is a singleton. Uh, okay. So it's automatically instantiated by the time you ask for it the first time. It doesn't mean that it's done in advance of when you ask for it, but it's no later than when you ask for it. So it's like an object, not a class. It yeah. is an object and it is yeah. a class. Oh. So, so there is a class called ecstasy, well, it's called ecstasy. Um, mm -hmm. And there is also an, one instance of that class, which you can also get with the same name, ecstasy. So mm -hmm. um, as you can imagine, it does, it does complicate the compiler a little, because when mm -hmm. you say ecstasy, it's like, am I referring to the module or the pet? Mm -hmm. And it's actually, in this case, it's actually three, because if, if you in, import a module, it's a package and it's a module and it's an instance. Yeah, I wouldn't make a distinction between packages. Well, because you have a mount point. So let me put it in, in terms you'd understand in terms of a directory structure. You have a mount point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Then you have the thing that's mounted. Right. Yeah. And then you have the, the instance. So you have kind of the class. Yeah. The, there's all three because you have class versus instance and then you have the mount point itself all right i'm missing it's, it's all fine well you know in unix um with uh there are two different kinds of mounts and for one of them you actually create a zero byte file up front and then you mount over that okay like it's it's been 30 years since i've used unix so yeah i probably don't remember this correctly but i i do remember after you unmount, the file is still there. It's just there's just a file, like a right. this, this 
has anyone used Unix besides me? Uh, like, I, I'm the worst worry Unix about it. administrator. So. It, it, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I just fine. remember that there was, there's two different kinds. There's one where there's a file there when it's not mounted, and there's one where you mount it to a virtual file thing. So how's that map to package and module? What's the difference between package and module? Right, I was trying to get to, yeah. So a module is a root. But if you look at that second line there, the package E, so that defines a package inside this module M. Now go back to the other one you were just at. Oh, this guy. Yeah. Oh, right, here yep. we are. Okay. So All that right. E is actually a package. Is it now, part, I can't, I, is it, I, are all the contents of E, uh, apparently you can code them inside the package mymicro.com. You can, but uh, does the E package more uh, makes visible all the all of its imports? Basically, it takes the entire module collections.xtclang.org and copies it there. It's not actually copied. It's a it's a map, right? It mounts that module there. So all the contents are visible inside the package, based on language visibility rules. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so it's basically just aliasing. The it aliases in the entire module. Okay. And because we have a container model for security, if that if that um, if that type system if that's part of if that's loaded as part of your type system, then you have access even into the private types, the private fields, whatever. Like, there's no. We don't use private as a security model, right? Like, wow. so we don't have a pretend security model. So basically, if if that uh, and and that's why, for example, serialization and deserialization work without uh, without a security concern, right? Because you can you can deserial you can look into the private parts and serialize it. You don't have to do anything special. On the other hand, if you're given a module as part of your type system from an outer container, then it's then it's opaque, right? You can't actually operate on that. Um, on any instance that comes in from the outer container. So, uh, so if you create, if you knew one within your container, you have access into its private parts and whatever. But if you're handed one from outside, it it's. Um, so you cannot can. actually, if the module is m.mycode.com, you cannot call the, if you somehow import the module, you cannot call dot e dot something array q. Mm, if. I didn't quite catch the question. Mm -hmm. You have a module m.mycom.com. That is the root of the module. Can you call, if you instantiate the, this module, can you call .e.arayadq, for example? Or it's uh, only visible inside the, the, the module? That's... Oh, e oh, so if you import m.mycom, mm -hmm. is yeah. there a package inside it called e? Yes, and in fact, the funny thing is there's a hidden package in every module called ecstasy, mm -hmm. which imports ecstasy.xtclang.org. So we and there's a okay. and there's a and there's a string class in there. I'm I'm gonna pretend it's easy. So it's just ecstasy.string. It's actually I think ecstasy.text.string, but whatever. Pretend it's ecstasy.string. So if so I can from within my code here, I could say um, string s equals new ecstasy dot 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 string and that's and it is the same type and the same class as string right so because it's just a alias yeah it's just an alias right so it actually compiles not to like in this case it doesn't compile to e dot whatever uh e dot array deck it actually the constant for that the interned constant if you will uh cliff is collections yeah. xtc lang org array deck yeah i mean i'm i'm i I'll, I'll get the same effect but i'm not doing it this way yeah. anyway it worked out well so we're, yeah, we're happy with the, with the status quo hey uh, is there a difference between uh like in this package e import collections at xtc lang dot uh, org. Uh, am I just like in, sort of like bringing in the names of things in in the module and calling it e? Is it like a yes? I mean, what is it, what else is it between module and package? Uh, 
Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Uh, in other words, I rename anything as I import them uh, or some, I'm putting them in E, actually, is what I'm doing. I'm putting yeah, them. Packages yeah, are you forced to rename every package as you import yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I guess I, it, it, well, you could say you're renaming collections.ecstasylang.org to E. Here. You are you are mounting collections as E. Right. Ah, yes. Okay. Now I'm see what you're saying. You're mounting it as E because you never, you cannot, there is no syntax for collections. There's no qualified name, qualified module name syntax except for in the package statement itself. Packet, well, sorry. You can see there's two places we use it. One when you name the module and one when you import the module as mm -hmm. when you mount it as a package. So nowhere else, nowhere else would we ever refer to uh, collections.xtclang.org. Okay. You can't, it's illegal. I mean, you can only refer to things in your tree. So package for you is always a mounted module. Ask that again. Um, a, a package is a mounted module or named mounted module, whatever. You... Well, I show two examples here. E is a named mounted module and P1 is just a, a real directory, if you will. Right, I put a class inside P1. Right, right, okay, got it, yep. So it's the same as uh, on your disk, you have some directories that are actually on your disk and you have some that are mount points onto the network. So, so how would you do, how would you do private imports? I mean, you, you said that E will be exported again, basically, right? Right. Well, so how would you do it's, a private it's implicit, it's implicitly there. Cause when we form a type system, we close over the uh, graph of modules that that are implied by the dependencies. So that so so we basically build behind the scenes. We basically build a mega module that has all the modules necessary to close over the type system. Um, so they're they're all there, and we don't try to hide them. Um, so oh. we 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 approach the the um, hiding that from a completely different perspective, like if it's in your type system and it's, if it's loaded as part of your type system, it's, it's fair game. You can do anything with it. Isn't, right, it, okay. uh, isn't, isn't it uh, difficult from the autocomplete uh, perspective? If you are, if you have, for instance, multiple places where like your array deck can come from because your module uh, um, imports to other modules on each of those uh, other modules have their own import of array deck? Yeah, I mean, in, in theory. Um, so what yeah. prevents it? But, it but they're the same, but they're the same class. True. It's but like having, that, it's like having multiple mount points for the same thing. It's still the same file that you're referring to. Sure, but I, I if I had if I uh, use uh, the language to write code, I really, I think in most cases, I would be really uh, uh, interested in having like the original mount point or getting the type from the original mount point and not uh, from yeah, some yeah. I mean, if, if in module. your module, if in your module, you import that package, that you import that module as a package, you're typically going to refer to it via that, via the package that you wrote. I, I understand your question. I'm just mm. I'm saying it's never been never been an issue. And if like, I could, and if I understood you correctly, um, after compiling, it will be interned to the actual original mount point, anyways. Correct. Yeah, the, the compiled right. form it always refers to the. I, I'd like to say that we always refer to the the fully qualified form, but we don't actually keep all that in one constant because then the. The compiled file would be ridiculously huge. So what we do is we we keep each constant keeps pointers to the constants it's built from. So think of them as inodes, not as not as Java super long strings of uh, you know how everything in Java actually starts with forward slash you know com forward slash sun for you, whatever the, the whole, it, it puts the entire thing into a giant string just because you're getting the X out of your point, right? So if you look at, if you look at get property for X, 
it's actually get property for the entire you know package 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 class inner class inner class field name as a string right and it's 17,000 characters long and you have 40,000 of those in your application and your your uh, yeah which is why which is why you have to zip to make a, a deployable yeah, I had a question, which is, you said you don't put a package statement. I got a module statement here. I mean, you like basically you want to be able to copy, move, like change the name of a directory and suddenly those things are in a different package or module or something. Um, is that accurate? And if so, I would think it's like kind of good documentation to like see what the package is at the top of the file. I mean, has that ever been a, a, like confusing? Like, well, which package am I in? I have to look at the directory name. It hasn't been. I'm not saying it couldn't be. I'm just saying it had, hasn't been. Um, you generally don't need, but so one of the things is our name resolution is also hierarchical. So for example, if I'm inside C, here, let me uh, edit the uh, thing a little bit, just to, let's say I have a C2 as well, right? So I have a class C2 here. So within my class C2, let's uh, I see Dan. I can, um, you know, I can say C, and that has a meaning, right? Because it's in the same directory, but I can also say, um, as you saw here with e.arraydeck, how did it find E, which is not in the same package? Well, it looks, it looks within its current scope, can't find an E, so it looks at this scope, can't find an E, so it looks at this scope, finds an E, and then walks down to arraydeck. Right, so it, it automatically, right. Uh, it's not looking through scope chains at runtime. No, no, no this is all no, no, it's all compile time. Yeah. So if I have C three here, I mean, I'm basically doing the same thing. I mean, everyone does something. Right, similar. I can say uh, you know, C three. I'll find that, so I don't have to import that. You know. So uh, import is just an a, a alias. So create an alias within my context for that name as this name, right? Did that answer the question? Yep. Yeah, that answered the question. That makes sense. So uh, I was just curious if in practice it, you ever were like wondering what package you're in. The other thing I guess I was wondering is, do you do anything for like changes over time? Like if someone changes a, you know, like one of the things that's hard for people in in industries, they end up having you know 150 libraries that they're using, and to upgrade, they have to upgrade 150 things. Yep. Um, uh, and so people do shadowing, like they'll rename the package just so they can use an old version of this. With a, you know, is yeah, that so a problem anybody a, tries to solve uh, these days? We have a radically different approach to that. So our versioning is also hierarchical. Um, so you can look at the version number. And so you can't totally order versions, but you can always tell if one version is related to another version um, in a descendant manner, because it's a tree. Um, and the reason is, is because when you compile a module, it creates a, an unstamped module file. Unstamped meaning it has no version. Well, it's stamped with a developer version. And then if you, know, you can, if you assume, if you like it, you can then give it a, a version number in that hierarchy. And what that can do then is you, and this is not implemented yet. So I'm, I'm gonna say it like it exists. So it's designed to do this. We just haven't written the code yet. We can actually take two of those and put them in the same file. So it basically does a zipper compression of that entire hierarchy within the, the, the structural hierarchy of the file. So you end up with version one and version two in the same file and also version 1.1 and 1.1.1 and 1.1.2 and so on. So, so what do you basically, version? What is the unit of versioning? Is it a module can get versions or a package? So or? modules are the unit of versioning, um, but within it, it's all deduped automatically. So it's still one constant pool across all those versions. So basically you're only, you're, you're only adding the deltas from version to version. So how do you distribute do you distribute all versions all the time? Like a git? So well, a, so, so basically the, the plan is you would deliver all of the supported and test versions 
And so, it, you know, when you de-support something, you would, you know, potentially remove it. Uh, you don't have to, but but basically, yeah, yeah, your okay. your one module file is is yeah. is all the including patches that you don't yet officially support or whatever. You can all put those all in one file, and what that does is it lets the the client side, if you will, the downloader decide which which patches to take, which version to use, etc. Um, and then the what I haven't shown you is there's a bunch of of capability in that import statement, the package definition where I import a, uh, a module. So there are three there are three clauses that I can add to that, add any number of these clauses to it, and they are uh, supports, prefers, and of uh, support. Uh, so I don't use these very often, so I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's it's basically you say, these are the versions I support. These are the versions I prefer, and these are the versions to avoid. So what that lets you do in a complex graph of modules, let's say you use two modules and each of them uses two modules and so on, and downstream 40 levels, you know, they both, the, the, there are 50 different libraries that all depend on the same library. And they each have versions that they want to avoid and versions that they want to prefer and, you know, so, and because, and you specify the version numbers within the hierarchy. So if you say, you know, version 1.1, that also implies 1.1.1 and 1.1.2 and so on. So it allows the linker, the loader linker process to um, using uh, Cliff, we talked about it last week, the satisfy, this is where the satisfiability mm -hmm. theorem came in, that's that's why we had to implement that. So it basically resolves across all the dependencies to see which which version it should take. And then within, within the code, it can actually have, if you have to, this is to be avoided as much as possible. Uh, but you can you can actually compile differently based on which things are there. And that again is done at link time. So basically if you have to support two versions, without breaking, you can actually put that into the code. So, and it's not a macro system. It's not because we've had to, you know, we've, mm -hmm. we've been, we've been through all the same pain you guys have with if defs and C++ and, and all mm -hmm. that crap. So it's, it's, um, it was designed to solve that problem where you have uh, multiple, um, multiple libraries, multiple versions of each. And, and they have to actually, act differently when one is present versus not present. And this is a huge problem, not so much for the end user, although they, they end up having to sort it all out, you know, the, the developer building the application and depending on the libraries, they have to actually do all the work of, of uh, what we call DLL hell in Windows or uh, mm -hmm. a jar hell in Java, et cetera. And it's definitely not the problem of the guy building the JVM or the CLR or whatever. They don't freaking care. It's like everyone's downstream to them. So you might as well just pee because it all goes downhill, right? Um, but in the middle, you have, you have like, look at NPM. I installed two NPM modules this week and it brought down 3000, like, mm -hmm no exaggeration and <laughs> you know so those that. are the people in the middle they're not building the app and they're not building um v8 uh, you know they're not building javascript no. but they have to work like with each other right and so when you're in the middle quite often the libraries you're building may act differently when another library is is present you know so uh uh because you trying not to step on them or you're trying to take advantage of the fact that they're there and so on. So it's, it's, it's a, well, it's, it's a big challenge. Does a void mean it won't actually link if those are the only ones available? If the only ones are available. That's right? correct. That's okay. correct. It that will, makes sense it, if something has a bug. It, it increases your the, test matrix uh, quite a bit if you say. I oh, yes, handle yeah, these absolutely. Versions. And because it's all data, and because all the versions are there, you don't have to recompile it to hit those. You compile it once, so it's encoded into the compiled form what those variations oh. are. And then you can do your n cubed, n quad, n to the fifth, et cetera, test matrix over it. And of course, you know, the more of these you have, it becomes, you know, n to the n to the n to the n to the n to the, you know. Okay. So you can imagine it can be bad. I really like, I never thought of that before to, to actually, it's like a Git repo. You have all the versions there. Um, that's 
pretty interesting. And then being flexible about, because like in when I'm using Git, I check out one branch at a time. So I'm like, I'm, I connect to this one. But, right. you know, it'd actually be nicer if I could, if there's three versions that I can connect to, why not let the app decide? Right. Make sure I test all three of those, then that's kind of nice. It, re it can reduce the size of the, you know, when people do the shadowing thing, they get, end up with this big, I have like seven different copies of Apache Commons. Oh, yep. You know, and I could compress that and make it smaller. And one of the things that inspired us to do this was back in 2003, maybe, we had a we had a commercial product. We were just getting our nose above the water. You know, we just got to the point where we were profitable. I, you know, I was almost about to write myself my first paycheck, right? And um, uh, and we had to do a release, and the release was held up because we were using um, Sax Socks or Dom uh, Sax or Dom, one of these parsers. And the problem is we had to support these different versions of web logic. And one version had one version. One version of web logic had one version of the parser, XML parser. Mm -hmm. And the other version of web logic had a different version. And Apache had made a, an incompatible change between those two versions. And the library came with web logic on the, if you will, the system class path. I mean, whatever it was back then. Um, so we couldn't support both versions of WebLogic and use that API. And we had customers using that API through our software, meaning we had to support the API, right? So, you know, like, how do you, how do you do it? So, you know, reflection and data, you know, it's a, and this was like, this was like holding up a, a major release and we had customers, you know, waiting for it. And so when we, when we designed this language, we said, never again, are we going to have to, you know, uh, go through that go through that crap right so that was that was that was one of the inspirations for that so the yes yeah, so there was a source code control system that used to do this right like manage all multiple versions all and you could just assemble that way there's envy so we did this in small talk but they were never able to successfully port it to uh, that functionality to uh, java mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, as 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 you know, everything was done first in small talk. <laughs> there's 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 nothing I will ever bring up that someone who's used small talk won't tell me that uh, yeah, we did it that way in small talk back in 1973. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't quite that long ago, but but that was like a Dave Thomas, right? Uh, small talk Dave Thomas uh, type pro of product, right? Uh, that yeah, I don't I don't I so I never. I never got to use small talk in real world. So. Right. But it, but it was but it was but it was really super nice because you basically when you built something you just had everything like available there in, in the in the repository you just go and, and then just assemble. Right? Yeah. So this whole problem you had with incompatible uh, uh, I think it was like a, was a, the uh, was a sax parser issue. I think I recall the, the issue you're talking about where they just baked in incompatible versions in the product and they're like shaking your head and you know now now what do we do um yeah those types of issues um are never really showed up in small talk because you know the lack of typing <laughs> so, right, sort of, mm. right. Yeah. but and the, and the fact that you're probably deploying the image that you made right locally, even so even though small talk is a strongly typed language Right, so you, you can get away with things like that, um, but yeah. But anyways, uh, it, it was really, really super nice, and you really missed it when we went to Java. It's like going like, oh gosh, you know, we're missing uh, a really nice way of building things like this. Anyways, and Ma so and when you compare Maven dependency management to that, it's like <laughs> you want to go hang yourself. <laughs> Well, I am I am fairly amazed by you know the fact that today building an application to say, you know, hello world, say using React for example, which is the thing I'm learning right now. Oh God, um, sorry. You know, it is dramatically harder in 2022 to build a simple application than it was in 1992. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's true. Absolutely. Absolutely true. And. Um, and, and not only that, once you've built it, the amount of cruft that is inherent in the system 
is at least three orders of magnitude larger. Like it's 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 it's, it's shocking. Yeah. Ugly stuff. All right, folks. I think we're reminiscing about the battle days. <laughs> and it's two hours in. Jeez. It's what lunchtime. We go into the models and packages and what it means for them to be models and packages. Yeah, no, I think it's good. There's a lot of food for thought for me. I, I what I'm going to do here. I think I some of the things I think I've sorted out kind of strongly, and some of the things are still nicely focused. Head. Focused. Yeah. 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 Yeah, All right. A lot of a lot of these things you don't really get a sense for until you use it in anger. It, yeah, exactly. It, that's that's <laughs> a, I'm not I'm not yet able to use it in anger, so I can't I can't feel on it yet. Yeah, I understand. I'd be trying to solve some other thing, and I'll go grab this damn thing I wrote as a module like two months ago for whatever, and it's, it didn't work and incompatible, blah blah blah. And I have to fucking change this. Oh, I gotta go change that. Oh no, I can't do it because the module requirement is this, and then like okay. Now you're using it in anger and you understand why the thing is. Uh-huh. I'll get there. All right, till we meet again. Okay. Cheers. Bye. Bye.